Hey everybody, this is Gregory from DAP University. So in this video, I'm gonna compare EOS versus Ethereum because there's a lot of competition between these two blockchains and DAP platforms, and I wanna get all the juicy details in this video. So before we do that, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and click the like button down below. And also, if you're interested in learning how to build blockchain technology, you can download my courses for free on my website over at dappuniversity.com forward slash free download. So let's talk about EOS versus Ethereum, okay? We're gonna talk about how they're different, what it means for you to be a developer on EOS versus Ethereum, and also like who's maybe gonna win this thing in the long run. So you're gonna wanna stick around to the end of this video to hear my thoughts on all of this. So just a quick refresher in case you're unfamiliar. So EOS versus Ethereum, these are both blockchains and dApp platforms, you know, platforms to run decentralized applications. So what are decentralized applications or dApps? Well, they're basically applications that don't have a central entity that controls them. You know, part of their code of the application lives on a blockchain or a dApp platform where you don't have to have a central authority that runs it. And that's opposed to like a centralized application that might run on a web server where, you know, some company owns all the code and, you know, maintains the server and they, you know, control all the data and stuff like that on an application. And, you know, an example of a dApp might be an application that uses smart contracts like a decentralized exchange like Ether Delta, which is basically an exchange that doesn't, you know, handle your user funds. You know, you control your user funds and you make trades. You don't actually have like a server that controls your private keys and controls your cryptocurrency. Like you do it yourself. That's the advantage of a decentralized application in this case. Right, and if you want to see more decentralized applications, you can see a whole list of them on a website like dapradar.com. So EOS and Ethereum are very different in how you know each of the networks work and also how they run dApps. So let's talk about that. Now the first big way that these two networks are different is in a user experience, right? So on Ethereum, users have to pay gas in order to make transactions on the network. Basically, a user has to pay a small amount of Ether or Ethereum cryptocurrency anytime they make a transaction on the network. So whenever they use an application that you know, is powered by a smart contract and they want to you know, talk to the smart contract and, and make transactions, they have to pay, right? That burdens on the user. Now, EOS, on the other hand, allows developers to stake tokens to pay the fees for using the applications, right? So why are there fees in the first place? Well, there's, there's fees because there's costs you know, to running the networks and those you know, costs have to go somewhere. Well, they go to the network. And there's differences between these two networks and you know, who potentially bears the burden of the cost, right? So let's talk about you know, some obvious questions that come to mind, which is you know, why would a user ever wanna pay to use an application? And why wouldn't it be just obvious uh, for you know, a platform to be paying the expenses, right? That's what users are used to in the first place. That's like a user experience that they know about from you know, using other applications. So let's talk about that. One, users might actually be willing to pay fees, especially in cases where we're talking about financial transactions in which the fees can basically get taken out of uh, you know, a transaction that they're gonna be paying for anyway. So people are actually used to this kind of thing. If I'm going to make a transaction and there's a small fee associated with it, that's common. That happens now. So if we're talking about migrating from a traditional financial system to a cryptocurrency financial system, I don't think there's going to be too much friction for people, you know, wanting to pay fees whenever they send money. They're just used to it, right? So on the other hand, if you're talking about non-financial applications and just, you know, general use applications where users might need to store some data, um, you know, if a platform is paying the fees for this, that cost is going to be passed on to someone, right? So let's take an example, right? If I'm a user and I want to, you know, log onto a social network completely for free, you know, there's a lot of costs associated with maintaining a social network, right? So that cost is recouped somehow. And in most cases, it's recouped by selling ads that I have to watch and see whenever I use the platform, right? So that cost is always, you know, taken somewhere else, right? Okay, now let's talk more about how the networks actually function, okay? And the first point I wanna make is this idea you know, of decentralization, which I talked a little bit about, right? And just reiterating, that's opposed to centralization, which you know, is where a single entity maintains 
central control over the code and the data in the application, right? And a decentralized, you know, network tries to democratize that and spread it out to where you know, there is no central control. So what is the philosophy, what is the, you know, the decentralized philosophy for each of these networks, Ethereum versus EOS? Well, Ethereum tries to be as decentralized as possible. It's one of the core values of the Ethereum community and the Ethereum network. Whereas EOS is less decentralized. EOS is basically willing to make trade-offs in order to achieve things like scalability on their network, okay? So let's take an example. You know, Ethereum tries to be very decentralized. You know, anyone can, you know, participate in the network and become a miner, right? And because of this, the network runs somewhat slow at the moment and can only process a limited number of transactions, as opposed to EOS, which tries to handle a larger volume of transactions by limiting the number of people required to confirm transactions and produce blocks on the network. And the difference between those two things that I just mentioned, that example, is the difference in the consensus algorithm of each network, okay? So Ethereum currently runs on a proof of work consensus algorithm, just like Bitcoin. So basically some of the nodes in the network are miners. So they compete to complete these cryptographic puzzles that essentially produce the blocks on the blockchain. And that's like an incentive reward for people to join the network and run it. They can get paid to like, you know, help maintain the network. And so Ethereum should be very decentralized in how it does this. Basically, it requires, you know, a large number of nodes on the network to actually confirm the transactions before they can be mined and, you know, considered part of the blockchain, right? So that's different from uh, EOS's consensus model, right? EOS's consensus mechanism or its consensus algorithm is called delegated proof of stake. And so what that is, is it only requires a small amount of block producers on the network to actually make new blocks. So instead of like a large number of, you know, nodes on the network having to uh, confirm transactions and produce new blocks, only a small number does. And that's what EOS does in order to try to, you know, speed up the network and process larger volume of transactions and things like that. And that kind of brings up the issue of scalability, which is, you know, a big war between these two blockchains and, you know, the blockchain ecosystem in general, right? It's really trying to achieve this issue of scalability. So, you know, I kind of talked about what EOS does, and then a lot of people were critical about, you know, this method because they say it produces, you know, security risks and also compromises decentralization, right? And so how does Ethereum try to solve those things? Like if Ethereum is, you know, considered somewhat slow at the moment, you know, how would Ethereum even get better and try to preserve decentralization? Well, that's something they're working very hard on, right? They're trying to actually implement things like sharding and plasma and Casper. So what are those, right? So sharding is breaking the network up into smaller blockchains and allowing, you know, these smaller subsets of the network to process, you know, some of the computational load. So the entire network doesn't have to, and that would speed things up. And also, you know, plasma is basically a way to do some operations on the blockchain off of Ethereum itself into these things called side chains or state channels. And also that would speed the network up. And then they're also talking about Casper, which would be moving to a proof of stake consensus mechanism. And that's not the same thing as delegated proof of stake like EOS, it's actually different. But those are the kinds of things that Ethereum is trying to do to bring, maintain as much decentralization as possible um, in order to speed their network up. All right, now let's talk about what it means to be a developer on EOS versus Ethereum. I'll actually start with Ethereum. So Ethereum, if you're gonna program for that blockchain, you're gonna be writing smart contracts with Solidity. Now Solidity is a new programming language built specifically for Ethereum. It's a language that looks a lot like JavaScript. And if you've ever written JavaScript before, you'd be like, you know, its syntax would look very familiar. And also if you have a JavaScript background, you know, Ethereum uses a lot of JavaScript inside of its ecosystem in order to interact with the blockchain itself. So you'd have a big advantage, you know, coming into that developer workspace, having that JavaScript background, right? And a, a big difference between Ethereum and EOS is the Ethereum smart contracts are immutable. So once you deploy them to the blockchain, you can't actually change the code. And that's part of decentralization and trust is that the code's out there for good and, you know, a user, when they see it, they know that it's not going to change. So EOS is different, right? 
So EOS, if you're going to come develop smart contracts for that blockchain, you're going to use C++. And some people see this as an advantage because C++ is an established language. It's been around for a very long time. And lots of people have learned C++. But there's some people who say this is not really that much of a benefit because a lot of modern day developers uh, who are working now don't use C++. You know, if you sort of randomly sampled uh, a lot of modern web developers, especially, a lot of them don't know C++. And so some say this isn't a huge advantage. Um, but uh, something that's also different that I mentioned earlier is, you know, smart contracts can be changed and upgraded on the EOS network. And that's part of EOS' whole philosophy of being like an operating system. So let's talk about the competition between these two platforms. All right, we'll start with the developer communities because a lot of people say, you know, the developers are what's going to really help push, you know, either one of these platforms forward, right? So Ethereum is very decentralized, like I've been saying, and, you know, its developer community is, has a strong background, like open source software and things like that. And that's very much how the ecosystem feels, right? Um, whereas EOS is a little bit different. Um, you know, EOS had a huge ICO that raised a lot of money, and that's a huge, you know, uh, advantage for them potentially. Now, some people say it's bad. Some people actually say that EOS has too much money and could burn through it. So, uh, you know, I don't know what your opinion is on that, but, you know, I can see that kind of going either uh, away. So these platforms kind of seem like they have two different competitive edges, right? Ethereum has, uh, some would say, a stronger sort of grassroots community, whereas EOS has, you know, a lot of money to put behind, you know, to building out their ecosystem, right? So also, it's worth mentioning that Ethereum, you know, people have been developing on Ethereum for a couple of years now, which is, you know, EOS's platform really just launched recently, right? And so with Ethereum, they kind of have a head start. And EOS does have some catching up to do in order to generate the kind of momentum that Ethereum has generated. And, you know, like I said, EOS has a lot of money. I'm not saying it can't happen. And so what does this mean for the competition between the two? Well, it's too early, I think, to really know the answer to that question. And also, I think it's helpful to know that it's not necessarily a winner-take-all scenario, right? It might be, but it might not be either. You know, it may not be a zero-sum game where someone has to be dethroned in order for someone else to win, right? There may be a market that, you know, each platform can take a slice of, right, and do what it's best at. You know, some people might use Ethereum for certain type of applications, and some people might use EOS for other types of applications. So time will tell, and we will see. So leave a comment down below about which one you think will win in the long run, or if you think anyone will really win in the long run. So hope you all like this video. Like I said, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, and click the like button down below. And also, you can download my courses for free on my website over at dappuniversity.com forward slash free download. Again, so I hope you all like this video. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.